And now the Lord says, he who formed me uh, from the womb to be his servant, uh, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honoured in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes um, of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to whom, uh, the, to, to one deeply despised, uh, abhorred by the nation, uh, the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen him. Amen. Um, we're going to open our praise. Uh, uh, the words on the screen there. So, um, uh, 160 of the book, Glory Be to God the Father. <laughs>
that you are the sovereign Lord over our lives. And we acknowledge and we worship you, Lord Jesus, our crucified and risen Savior, who has ascended to the right hand of God the Father, that you are Lord of lords and King of kings, and the judge of all humanity. And so we worship you this morning, living and mighty God. And as we come into your presence this morning, Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that we are sinners. We acknowledge that we are those who um, don't stand in your presence because we are righteous in ourselves. We stand in your presence not because we are righteous, but as those who trust in your grace and mercy and are uh, justified by the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we confess, Heavenly Father, therefore all of our sin before you, all of the ways which, in which we uh, do wrong in your sight, Lord God, we confess that we fall short in so many ways, short of your standards. Uh, but we thank you for the mercy that is ours through Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, and we pray, Heavenly Father, for your forgiveness for all of our sins. And that you would, through your Holy Spirit, lead us in the paths of righteousness. That you would sanctify us, conform and shape us to the image of Christ. And be with us for the remainder of our worship. And we pray all of these things through the name of Jesus our Saviour. Amen. So our scripture reading is Psalm 5, we looked at Psalm 4 last week, and a few psalms over the summer period. Um, so Psalm 5, the next psalm um, in succession, um, this is a psalm of David, um, uh, for the director of music for flutes, a psalm of David. Um, so let's hear the word of the Lord. Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my sighing. Listen to my cry for help, my King and my God. For to you I pray. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning I lay my requests before you and wait in expectation. You are not a God who takes pleasure in evil. With the wicked you cannot dwell. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. You destroy those who tell lies, bloodthirsty and deceitful men. The Lord abhors. But I... By your great mercy will come into your house. In reverence I will, will I bow down towards your holy temple. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make straight your way before me. Not a word from their mouth can be trusted. Their heart is filled with the destruction. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongue they speak deceit. Declare them guilty, O God. Let their intrigues be their downfall. Banish them from, for their many sins, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. For surely, O Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favour as with a shield. Amen. And may the Lord our God bless your hearts and minds up reading from Scripture for this holy and an errant word. Now kids, great to see you all here this morning. And uh, got something to put up on the screen there. Now, who is that character? Who is this fella? Yes. Captain America. Captain America, right? Captain America. So didn't didn't take long. Well, we all know Captain well, so most of us here know Captain America. Um uh, and Captain America is part of what group is he in? Yes. Avengers. He's the Avengers, and Avengers are part of the. They were comics, and one was known as. Do you know what they are? Marvel. Marvel, and the other one's DC, isn't that right? So all these characters are based off these comics, and the the the. Uh, I've learned this from my kids, by the way. Um, so um, they are the the Avengers, all those. They're all part of the Marvel Universe, aren't they? So, um, so you have like Captain America, Spider-Man, the Hulk. They're all part of the Marvel. There's a whole chapter of them. They're all part of the Marvel Universe. And then there's DC, which is Batman, Superman, and a lot of others in the DC Universe. But what is, what is Captain America known for? What's he, what's he known for? <coughs> Especially. Yes? Is a hero. he's a hero, but what, what kind of what special thing does he do? Or? His shield, 
He's known for his shield, isn't he? Now, I think he has other superpowers. He's maybe a bit indestructible, and because he got a, he was the victim of an experiment or something, which gave him superpowers or super strength or whatever. But he's known for his shield, right? Yes, he's known for his shield. Um, so um, this is his shield. Um, but he has also other things that he can do as well. But his shield is, what does he do with his shield? He can protect himself and... Block himself from attacks? He can protect himself, he, he uses it. To throw it. He can throw it, right? Yeah, he uses it as a weapon as well, doesn't he? It? So it's a, it's a sort of shield and a weapon that he can use, yeah. Um, so Captain America, he used this shield in a very special way, okay, and that's his signature, that's his hallmark, okay. Um, shields protect, don't they? So, um, you know, in the ancient times, soldiers had shields. Um, shields go back thousands of years, actually. Here's Roman soldiers with their shields, and they form a sort of phalanx of you know, protection using their shields, and shields go all the way back to, you know, uh, Babylonians and Egyptians, they all used shields. Um, shields protect in battle um, and they stop a soldier from getting hurt from arrows and swords, spears, that sort of thing. Um, now, obviously, an army that can, can get past soldiers, shields can, can obviously kill them or hurt them, um, but they're there to protect. And the reason why I'm thinking about Captain America and his shield and, and shields this morning is because of the Bible passage we were looking at. Because David ends this psalm and he says, For surely, O Lord, you bless the righteous, you surround them with your favour as with a shield. Okay, now David was a warrior, he knew how to use a sword and a shield. Um, and he's saying, The Lord is a shield to protect his people, the Lord's favour, his mercy. And you know, kids, when we trust in the Lord Jesus, we are protected by God. He saves us from the judgment that is to come, and he uh, blesses us. He surrounds us with his protection. It doesn't mean that difficult things don't happen to us in life, but the Lord is there to protect us, and we will never be lost. Uh, but we have the gift of eternal life. And so the Lord, when you put your trust in the Lord Jesus, God, you belong to God, and he protects you and he surrounds you with his blessing and protection forever. Okay, so I want you to remember that. I want us all to remember that. And I want you to put your faith in Jesus. Uh, I want us all to do that here and know that through Jesus Christ, God is our saviour, our protector and our defender and our shield. So thank you for listening. Um, we're going to uh, sing your praise, uh, which is 117. Um, God's love is deeper than the deepest ocean.
let's go and pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being able to gather here in your presence, and we do so as a people who recognise that we have so much to be thankful for. We thank you that through Christ our Saviour, we are assured of your fatherly care. Um, the depth of your love, which we've been singing about there, Lord, is known to us through faith in Jesus and um, through our salvation. And we thank you indeed that you have redeemed us according to your great loving kindness um, uh, in Jesus whom you've sent to us, your beloved Son, who died for our sins and is risen again. Um, and that we live now in your mercy and uh, we have your eternal blessing and eternal life through Christ. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have lived and died for us in our place as our <coughs> substitute and that through faith in you we have redemption and eternal life. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that you lead and guide us through life and that you provide for us so we can bring each and every day all of our needs to you, Heavenly Father, and that you supply all our needs and you give us all the good things that we enjoy in life. We thank you for that. We thank you for this opportunity to be here this morning um, and uh, in your presence as your people um, and that we do so in the presence and fellowship of the Holy Spirit who enables us um, and who, who brings us into fellowship with you. Um, thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can bring our prayers and petitions before you. Uh, and we can do that as your people this morning. And we pray, Lord God, that you would bless uh, our time now as we worship and uh, continue indeed to bless our joint summer services, uh, that we would know your presence with us over the summer period uh, as we worship jointly. We pray, Heavenly Father, uh, for all who are sick among us and known to us, uh, that you would bring healing and restoration to them. We pray for all those who are frail and in care, that you would comfort them and be with them and enable them just to look to you and to know your fatherly care. We pray, Lord God, for our government at this time, uh, as a uh, new Prime Minister is sought, and uh, we pray for good and upright leadership in our nation, um, and that those who govern us here locally in Northern Ireland and in Westminster would do so with wisdom and in such a way as to allow for the freedom and flourishing of your church. Uh, in our land and in our nation. Uh, we continue to remember and pray for the situation in the Ukraine uh, for an end to this terrible aggression that has caused this war and that you would uphold and sustain those who have been injured and bereaved through this conflict and uh, those who have been displaced and that they would be able to return in due course to their homes and to their land. And we pray for peace and stability in, in our world, that that would prevail in your mercy, Lord. We pray for ourselves, Lord God, as a people, uh, people of Drumgulland and Kilkenamurray, that we would be those who in our daily lives look to Christ, our crucified and risen Saviour, rejoice in you, Lord God, rejoice in the forgiveness and grace that is ours through faith in Jesus. Enable us to be, Heavenly Father, a people who um, rejoice in Jesus each and every day and glorify him in our lives. And so, Father God, we ask and we pray all of these things through the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. So we're going to sing again, and uh, we're going to uh, sing a uh, well known to us, Speak, O Lord.
Justice and what is right is something that we all appeal to, isn't it? You know, our sense of right and wrong and justice. Uh, we have a, an especially keen sense of, of justice when we feel aggrieved um, or we feel we're being treated unjustly, uh, in principle at least. Um, uh, I'm sure all of us would say that we like to see justice done. Um, what is just, however, and uh, what is justice in any given situation is a deeper question. Um, people differ in their understanding of um, you know, justice and, and they disagree and over, uh, argue over what is just. Um, and if we're being honest with ourselves, uh, all of us are capable of behaving in ways that are unjust. It's called sin. You know, we are sinners and we are capable of being selfish uh, and on principle whenever it suits us. Nevertheless, we still want our politicians uh, to be just and fair and our courts to administer uh, proper and fair justice. And the basis of civilization then is the administration of justice, the basis of any uh, great and functioning civilization. Uh, I was reading about uh, this guy recently, Hammurabi, um, who was the king of Babylon nearly, nearly 4,000 years ago. Um, he conquered and he ruled Mesopotamia and Sumeria. Um, and Hammurabi, well, he, was a, he was a great and fearsome king uh, and, and a conqueror. But he's also remembered for being one of the first great rulers to create a universal system of laws and legal precedents so that his entire empire would have this uniform system or code of justice. Um, he didn't want to rule in some sort of ad hoc way and his underlings and governors to rule in an ad hoc way. He wanted everybody to live under the same code of law and this to be applied universally. Uh, Hammurabi put it this way, that he wanted to cause justice to rise like the sun over the, the people that he ruled and to light up the land. So he created, and that, that beside him is Hammurabi's code um, uh, that, you know, the, the, the uh, engraving there, uh, the system of laws and justice that he, he created. The Bible teaches us, however, that we must take our standards of justice ultimately from what God says. Uh, not just from our own personal feelings uh, or opinions. Um, true justice then is grounded in God and his character. And true uh, right and wrong and true justice is based on God's word, uh, the Bible. And in this psalm, David appeals in his prayer to God's justice. I'm sure you, you noticed that when, we were reading, when I was reading it. He, he appeals to God's justice, particularly in verse 10 where the psalmist David asks God to judge his persecutors, to judge them, you know, to cut them off from, from the land and from among the people. Um, David isn't just being vindictive when he does that, David turns then not just to his own ideas or feelings, though he feels strongly aggrieved. But he appeals to the Lord as the righteous judge. Um, in the face of enemies who are undermining and opposing him in his rule as Israel's king, he appeals to God's justice. Um, and this psalm, like Psalm 4, which we looked at last Sunday, is a lament in the sense that it is a prayer for help, a cry for help in the midst of distress and trouble um, <coughs> and persecution. Uh, we don't know the specific circumstances, we never really do, or well, we do have some specific uh, psalms where, where specific circumstances are given. But it, it's a general, you know, they are, the, the, the words of the psalms are generalized, so that it's for all of God's people in similar circumstances. Um, David, while he was the renowned king of Israel, and Israel's greatest king, really, um, also faced many trials and ups and downs. Uh, being king of Israel was no cakewalk. Um, he suffered a, an awful lot of uh, ups and downs and difficulties and oppositions and, and suffered from his own failures and sins as well as we know. Um, uh, and he faced opposition and danger not just from external <coughs> enemies but also from um, internal opponents, fellow Israelites, who sought to undermine and discredit him. 
Uh, and the psalm then, this psalm is his cry to God for help and his prayer for justice. And the psalm being um, an impassioned plea for help and justice then teaches us fundamental principles of prayer and fundamental principles of Christian life that I want to focus on. There are five basic elements of this psalm. Uh, verses 1 to 3, we have David's impassioned plea to God. Secondly, in, in verses 4 to 6, we are pointed uh, to who God is in terms of his holiness. Thirdly, in verses 7 and 8, we are pointed further to who God is in terms of his mercy. Uh, fourthly, uh, in verses 9 and 10, we have David's plea for justice. And finally, fifthly, in verses 11 and 12, David proclaims his confidence in God's protection. So first of all, in verses 1 to 3, David calls out, he cries out to God, this, this impassioned, anguished plea, anguished prayer. Um, and the first thing I, 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 I notice about this, and I, I want you to note about it as well, uh, these first few verses, is the impassioned nature of David's prayer. Uh, David's prayer is full of deep emotion. Um, and intensity. He pleads with the Lord, consider my sighing. Um, Hebrew word translated sighing means deep musing and reflection. Um, in other words, David brings before the Lord his, his innermost thoughts when he's in prayer, um, and when he prays. And he goes on to say, listen to my cry for help. David brings the innermost troubles of his heart and the preoccupations of his mind before the Lord and expresses them before God um, as an anguished cry. Um, this is an earnest appeal to the Lord for help, for deliverance. And it emphasizes David's trust in and reliance upon the Lord, just that the, the, the Lord was his both his first and his last port of call, if you like. Um, what we learn from this then is that prayer for God's people, those who truly trust in the Lord, should be an expression of our total reliance upon the Lord. Um, when we come before the Lord in prayer day by day, um, you know, we do so trusting in the Lord as our true and only hope and helper. And as those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we now have access with boldness into God's presence. Um, we can come to God now as our loving Heavenly Father with earnest appeals. That's one of the, the rich blessings of salvation. And um, this is how the Lord wants us to come to Him in prayer. Um, are our prayers like this? Uh, do we pray with the same earnestness that David does in times of trouble with this intense conviction? We have every reason to. Uh, the Lord is our <coughs> help and our salvation, our Heavenly Father who loves and cares for us. And we can come with boldness into his presence. Not only do we see that David's prayer is earnest then and impassioned, but also that in prayer he acknowledges God's authority. You see that there, my, my King and my God. Um, verse, two, verse 2 there. In other words, uh, David acknowledges the divine authority of the Lord uh, over his life as he comes to God in prayer. Um, some psalms speak, uh, some of the psalms speak of God as king in the sense of acknowledging his being ruler over all creation. Other psalms, like this one, speak of God as king in the sense of acknowledging that he is the Lord and ruler of his people. So here David is acknowledging Lord, the, the Lord as king of his people in Israel. Uh, but both as aspects of, of God's kingship are equally true, of course. Uh, and so when we come before the Lord in prayer, like David, we should do so worshipfully. Acknowledging God's kingship over everything around us and acknowledging his lordship <coughs> over us and over our lives. Prayer is not just about us. Prayer is about glorifying God and acknowledging him as a sovereign ruler over all things uh, and over our lives. And so real prayer involves heartfelt submission to the Lord uh, uh, as Lord and King over all of circumstances and over our lives and giving him that glory and that right and that acknowledgement. We also see in the first few verses then um, 
that through heartfelt and worshipful prayer, David then finds assurance. And we see that in verse 3. He's brought this plea and he now finds assurance. In verse 3, having brought his plea, um, he brings his prayers to the Lord. We're told here in the morning time. Um, in the morning, O oh Lord, you hear my voice. Last Sunday, Psalm 4 is described as an evening psalm. Um, because David prays in anticipation of being able to sleep peacefully. Um, but uh, here we now have a, what is termed a morning prayer. Uh, because David begins a new day with prayer. And through his impassioned <coughs> prayer he finds assurance then for, for his new day. Um, David is convinced that the Lord will hear his anguish pleas. Uh, the phrase uh, in verse 3, I lay my requests before you. Uh, could also be translated uh, from the original Hebrew phrase, uh, uh, phrasing, I prepare a sacrifice for you. Um, so this could actually describe uh, David, uh, you know, uh, bringing a sacrifice before the Lord. Nevertheless, sacrifices would have been offered with prayers anyway. And so the idea is that through heartfelt prayer uh, and genuine worship and trust in the Lord's mercy, the worshipper finds assurance before God and looks ahead with expectant faith. Um, perhaps, you know, there's a little pointer there, you know, prayer in the evening uh, and prayer in the morning. Uh, it's not that we have to do it that way, but, you know, David begins the day with, with prayer and finds assurance and, uh, you know, um, as I say, you know, expectant mercy of God, which gives him assurance. For the beginning of his new day and we then as those who come before God trusting in his mercy to us in Jesus Christ who has died for our sins uh, and who makes us accepted and acceptable before God can have absolute assurance as we bring our issues uh, before the Lord in prayer um, through Christ our Saviour we have the promise that God hears us that he will help us that he will lead us that he will guide us uh, that he will bless us, uh, that we are heard. Uh, and so worshipful prayer is a source of assurance to us in our lives, something that we should be doing routinely, day by day, morning by morning. Worshipful prayer uh, brings us assurance uh, in our lives. Secondly, um, verses 4 and 6, David then declares that the Lord is a, is a God of justice. Uh, now he, he does this by highlighting this truth, uh, highlights this truth really by describing in vivid terms the sinful behaviour of his opponents. Um, describing them here as we see as wicked, as arrogant, as wrongdoers, those who tell lies, those who are bloodthirsty and deceitful. And he then just also describes God's responses to these kind of people. David tells us that they cannot dwell with God, that they cannot stand in God's presence, that the Lord abhors their behaviour and will destroy those who live this way. So it's, it's very a strong and imprecatory prayer. Um, and we are left in no doubt as to where these evildoers stand in relation to God. Um, they cannot and they will not have access to God and they do not dwell with God and they will not dwell with God in eternity. But if we go to Psalm 15, David then positively describes the character of those who, by contrast, do dwell um, with the Lord. Psalm 15, verses 1 to 3, David declares, O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell in your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right, and speaks the truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue, and who does no evil to his neighbour, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. Those who truly know the Lord, who trust in the Lord, submit are those who submit to what is right. Uh, they do not slander others, they do not reproach, they do not do evil to their neighbour. And so David is reminding us in these verses 4 to 6 of this psalm that those who pursue evil, even if they claim to know the Lord, they cannot stand in God's presence. You know, we cannot behave like that and, and be those who truly know and have true fellowship with the Lord. <coughs> um, even if they claim to know the Lord, they cannot stand in God's presence. He reminds us then that the Lord is holy and upright. 
Now that doesn't mean, of course, that because of our sin we are absolutely excluded from God's presence. If that is the case, then all of us would be excluded permanently from God's presence. The difference between these evildoers and David, uh, these evildoers who David describes here, and David and the righteous like David, uh, the faithful person, is repentance and acknowledging sin. Uh, and, and this uh, being evident then in their lives. Um, the evildoers of verses 4 to 6 who are excluded from God's presen presence are unrepentant and persistent sinners. Verses 4 to 6 then are, I suppose, a reminder to you and me that as we come to the Lord in prayer, we need to confess our sins and live daily in repentance and in the joy of forgiveness and therefore as those who are being transformed by God's grace. God is holy and salvation is salvation unto holiness um, and therefore we come before the Lord as a holy God in repentance. Thirdly then, what David says about God's holiness and those who cannot come into his presence leads on to God's mercy. Um, having described the lifestyle and behaviour of those who are faithless and ungodly and unrepentant, David recognises that he and by association all true believers are accepted by God on the basis of mercy. He declares in verse 7, But I, I by your great mercy, will come into your house. Evildoers behave like this. And he doesn't say, because I'm so righteous, I can come into your presence. He says, no, but I, by your great mercy, will come into your house. Um, in other words, even though David, as a faithful worshipper of the Lord, stands in contrast to the evildoers described in verses 4 to 6, David recognises that he still only has access to God by God's grace and mercy. He knows that he is a sinner saved by grace who depends wholly on the mercy of the Lord. And that's how we should come before the Lord in our prayers, as those depending on his mercy. The Hebrew word translated mercy there is hesed, found commonly throughout the Old Testament. It means steadfast love. And, you know, that phrase in the NIV there, by your great mercy, could be translated by your abundant steadfast love. In other words, David was someone who knew that it was only because of the abundant mercy of God that he could enter into God's presence. Um, and the same is true for us. We enter into God's presence by the abundant mercy of God to you and I through Jesus Christ our Lord and in trust. And we see how David anticipates then entering into God's presence. He speaks in verse 7 of coming into the Lord's house of bowing down towards his holy temple. The temple hadn't yet been built, actually. It was built in Solomon's day, <coughs> the time of David. Um, but yet David refers to the temple here, God's house. Um, of course, David anticipated the building of the temple. He made elaborate preparations for his son Solomon to, to, to build the temple in his day. Uh, perhaps this is a reference to the continuing use of the tabernacle. But David, the important thing here is that David anticipates being in the Lord's presence. That's what motivates him. That's what fills him with joy. Being in the Lord's house. That's what he longs for. In the Old Testament, the temple and the tabernacle was the place where true worshippers longed to be. Because it was the place that God had designated that he was present in a special way in the Old Testament times. The earthly temple then was a kind of like a little earthly copy of God's heavenly sanctuary. Um, and David is declaring here that by the abundant mercy of God, by the grace of God, he can enter into God's presence. And for you and I who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, this blessing of access, of coming into the presence of God, is completed and fulfilled through Jesus. We don't need temple priesthood and sacrifice anymore. We can come through our eternal sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ, right into the presence of God. Through faith in the Lord Jesus, we have the, the privilege of full access into God's presence. And the Apostle Paul reminds us of that in, in chapter Ephesians chapter 3, verse 12. In Christ, he says, we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in Christ and in him through Christ. And one day, folks, we will dwell entirely in God's presence. 
as we're told in Revelation 21 and verse 22, that the Lord Almighty and the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, will be our temple, the dwelling place of God's people in the world to come. In other words, in the glory of the new creation, you and I will dwell entirely in God's presence and he will dwell with us in perfect fellowship. That's our destiny. And so we ought to rejoice now in the fact that when we pray, we already have full access to God. By God's grace, through faith in Jesus. And that's something that should enthuse our prayer. It's something that should encourage our prayer. It's something that should also humble us in prayer. We are accepted, as David reminds us, by grace, by God's steadfast love to us in Jesus. Accepted in the presence of God. What a privilege. Let's make use of our privilege as we pray day by day. But that grace that David speaks of here also brings transformation. You see in verse 8 there how David, who is accepted into God's presence by grace alone, prays then that the Lord will lead him in the right way. God's people have a hunger and thirst through prayer for righteousness. Okay, you can't be a Christian and say you love the Lord and then go live whatever way you like. God's grace produces the fruit of righteousness in our lives. You see that as David prays. He, he wants to walk in straight paths. David's prayer isn't just for deliverance from circumstances. In verse 8 he prays that the Lord will also lead him in his righteousness and make a straight path for him. David is concerned that he lives the right way. And what David's praying here then is not only will the Lord deliver him from his opponents, but also enable him in the midst of all of this mess to live uprightly, to live in accordance with God's truth. And that should also be our concern and our prayer in the midst of difficulty. That we who are saved by God's grace also honour the Lord in the midst of our circumstances. Pray that we should be praying to the Lord that he would teach us uprightness and make our paths straight in the midst of our, our opposition, and our enemies, our difficulties. Um, so the Lord teaches us to live uprightly. He tests us through these difficult circumstances so that we can cultivate a proven godly character. That's, that's so important and so central for what, in terms of what God is doing in our lives. God uses opposition and distress and tribulation in our lives to bless us in terms of teaching us to, to have godly character. As the Apostle Paul says in Romans 5, we know this passage well, this verse, we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Fourthly then, we see in verses 9 and 10 that David then pleads before the Lord for justice. Okay, and this, this is where he gets pretty heavy in terms of praying against his enemies, and that might not sit easily with us because we find this, you know, we, we wouldn't necessarily pray like this. Uh, he prays for justice, he prays the Lord will thwart the schemes of his enemies, um, that he will, God will judge them, that he will declare them guilty and cause them to be brought down by their own schemes. Um, now while this is a forceful prayer for judgment against these evildoers, uh, we should also see this prayer of David for judgment on his enemies <coughs> as being merciful as well. Why do I say that? that? Well this psalm, you remember, like all the psalms, was a public hymn. It would have been sung publicly by a throng of people worshipping at the temple. Um, and so this clause in which David prays for judgment against his enemies acts as a warning to all evildoers of what awaits them if they pursue their evil course of action. So there is a merciful aspect to it. It is a challenge which gives all of those with evil intent pause for thought so that they might repent as well as being a a prayer for actual judgment. And the prayer is stark. David prays that these evildoers will be banished, which is the language of Deuteronomy 30 and verse 4, you know, which decreed that Israelites who lived in rebellion against the Lord would be cut off from among God's people, cut off from salvation. Although these people plot against David, these opponents ultimately live in rebellion against the Lord, Why? Because to harm or oppose or undermine God's anointed servant is to act against God himself. That's why David says in verse 10, for they have rebelled against you. 
doesn't say, oh, they're doing terrible things to me here. He says they have rebelled against you. And interestingly, actually, as an aside, the Apostle Paul quotes the description of these evildoers um, by David in verse 9 in Romans 3 to show how all of humanity, Jew and Gentile, have sinned against the Lord. So this is a prayer uh, and a warning of judgment upon all who live in opposition to the Lord. And it teaches us that you know, our prayers, in our prayers we should ask God to judge justly in the midst of opposition and difficulty and, and lay that before the Lord and not take justice into our own hands, but bring it before God. But it's also, it's also a pointer to us as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ that we should also pray for those who are our enemies, that they will find repentance and salvation. And finally, David's prayer is that all who take refuge in the Lord, that is turned to him in trouble, will rejoice and be glad through knowing God's protection, knowing the Lord's protection. And here we see that David moves from his own particular dilemma in verses 1 to 3 to a general prayer for all who love the name of the Lord. In his prayer, David feels himself to be part of a greater people. It's not just me and my problem, but he expands it out to all of God's people, the people of God. And so his prayer widens out to a prayer for all of the godly, all who trust in the Lord. And that teaches us that in our prayers, we should be moved to praying beyond ourselves for others and for the wider church and for the wider kingdom. And, and for God's people generally and their play. Uh, we also see that David's cry for help, his turning to the Lord, his trust in God's mercy, his prayer for justice, now leads him to a place of confidence. David is convinced through, through his prayer that despite all of his troubles, the Lord blesses the righteous. He is convinced of that. Doesn't, he sees his troubles, okay, he's cried out to God, but he is convinced that despite all of that, God blesses the righteous, those who trust in the Lord. And that God, the Lord, surrounds them with his favour like a shield, as we said, to the boys and girls. The word translated favour there speaks of God's pleasure, his delight in his people. God's delight in those who turn to him, who trust in him, who seek him, who are saved through him. It's like a shield around them. He delights them. And he loves them and he will protect them and he will uphold them. Like a shield, you know, that protects us. Those who love the Lord's name can always rejoice because of God's protecting mercy. And our great blessing is to have a name given to us. The name of the Lord Jesus, in whom we trust and through whom we have forgiveness, redemption and assurance of God's eternal blessing and protection and fatherly care. And so as we bring our problems, our difficulties uh, and our distresses before the Lord, uh, as we too cry out to God in worshipful and impassioned prayer, appealing to his justice, trusting in his grace, we will know the comfort of the Holy Spirit and the assurance that David speaks of here um, and the assurance that the Lord will help us and bless us. So let's be those then, folks, who learn from David. Bring our impassioned pleas before the Lord day by day, trusting in his grace, being assured that through the name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus, our Heavenly Father will provide for us, will protect us and will bless us. Let's bow our heads in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this psalm and we thank you for your word and your truth. Thank you, Jesus, that you are our Saviour and Redeemer and that through you we have the covenant mercy and fatherly care of God Almighty. And I pray, Father, that each one here would look to love and know and trust in Jesus as Lord and Saviour and know that blessing in the midst of difficulty that you lead, guide and protect us and know your saving grace in their lives. Uh, and so I pray these things, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to sing, uh, we're going to sing uh, our final item of praise, 95. Now thank we all our God. <laughs>
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.